Uh, now I uh, would like to welcome uh, to the stage Dr. Vivek Murthy, the uh, 19th Surgeon General of the United States, to talk a little bit about uh, loneliness and your work and interest there. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. So I'm going to start with a really tough one. How did you get into this? <laughs> Well, let me just say how, how wonderful it is to be here. Mm -hmm. This is my very first trip to Louisville. Welcome. And I'm, um, I'm blessed to be here with my wife, Alice. It's her first trip here as well. And we have just felt so welcomed uh, in this uh, beautiful city by the warm people we've met and have just really enjoyed everyone's hospitality. So thank you. Uh, thank you so much. My uh, journey to work on loneliness is not something I would have predicted a few years ago. Um, when I had to testify in front of the uh, U.S. Senate as part of my confirmation process for being Surgeon General, they asked me, what will your priorities be as Surgeon General? And I will tell you that loneliness was not on my list at that time. But what really happened to me is that I was educated by the communities that I met all across America, whether they were big cities on the coast or small towns in the Midwest or fishing villages in Alaska. I went to many of these communities as part of a listening tour with the simple question, uh, which is how can I help? And I tried as best I could to just sit back and listen to what the, the answers were. And what I found were many stories that people told, stories of depression, concerns they had about addiction in their community, worries they had about chronic illness, uh, in their, not in their neighborhoods, uh, concerns they had about violence and how it affect their children. But behind many of these stories were also stories of deep pain a deep emotional pain, not just physical pain. And that pain often manifests as loneliness. Now, no one ever came to me and said, hi, my name is Steve and I'm lonely. But what was often unsaid was this deeper pain that was manifesting as loneliness. And it took just a little bit of probing. It took just giving people permission to explore that, uh, for the stories to come forth. And they often did. Um, stories about from men and women, from the elderly and the young, from people from all walks of life uh, who confessed that they had been struggling with loneliness and they weren't sure what to do about it. Now, what was interesting to me about this is that it actually wasn't the first time I had encountered loneliness. As a doctor caring for patients, I uh, now reflect on the fact that loneliness was the most common pathology that I saw in the hospital, more common than heart disease or diabetes. I had a patient who I was seeing once who won the lottery. Actually, he literally won the lottery. And uh, he had a stream of money coming uh, to him every year. But the first thing he said to me uh, when I walked into the clinic room is he said, I won the lottery and it was the worst thing that ever happened to me. Hmm. And I said, well, why is that? And he said, well, I had a job I loved and I quit. I had customers who loved and appreciated my work and I lost them. Uh, I lived in a neighborhood which was modest. I had a small house, but my neighbors and I knew each other. And I moved to a rich, expensive neighborhood where everyone had big walls between their houses. And now I don't know anyone. And he said, I became all alone. Uh, and that's why winning the lottery was the worst thing that happened to me. But perhaps most personal of all was that I had experienced loneliness myself. Uh, and, and starting from a very young age. I still remember going to school, elementary school, each morning with my parents dropping me off and feeling this pit growing in the uh, you know, depths of my stomach. And not because I was worried about an exam or because I was worried about homework, but it was, I was worried about feeling alone you know, when I went to school. And I was a shy kid who wanted to hang out with other kids but wasn't always sure how to go about doing that. And so I reflected on all of that and when I was coming toward the end of my time in office and started looking into the science around loneliness, recognizing that loneliness is not just a bad feeling, but it's something that has profound consequences for our health. So people who actually struggle with loneliness have a higher rate of heart disease, dementia, depression, anxiety, uh, but also they seem to live shorter lives. And the amount of, of longevity that you lose uh, the, that's associated with loneliness is similar to the mortality impact, if you will, of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. It's greater than the mortality impact of obesity. And think about how much attention we give to obesity and smoking versus how much uh, we pay to, to loneliness. So this is what led me to realize that loneliness is not only common, uh, affecting double-digit percentages you know, of adults in the United States, um, infecting more people than the number of people who have diabetes in the United States, 
but it's also consequential for our health. It impacts how we show up in the workplace in terms of our productivity. It impacts how our children are performing in school. And it even contributes, I believe, to a failure uh, of dialogue at a community level. All of us have had the experience of having a bad day at work or at school, going home after that bad day, and then trying to resolve a conflict with a spouse or with a family member. And how many times has that gone really well? Uh, I'll, t I'll tell you from my own personal experience, like having done this, that it doesn't go well. <laughs> but imagine now a nation of 300 million people who are struggling with challenges with their own emotional well-being, who in many cases are struggling with loneliness, who are then trying to come together and talk about profound challenges like healthcare and climate change and poverty and race. And it's not a massive surprise that those conversations don't go as well as they could. So that is why I came to realize that this is not just an issue, but one of the central issues, I think, of our time, the fundamental question of how do we better connect with each other. And it's why I decided in my time after serving uh, to focus on it, um, to write a book on it, which I'm working on right now, um, and to try to do everything I could to, to create more connection uh, in my life, in the lives of people around me, and hopefully in our community more broadly. What are the factors that are driving loneliness and the epidemic, at the epidemic sort of levels that we're talking about now? You know, it's a really interesting question. And I think one thing that's important to know is that loneliness is not a, a new phenomenon. People have struggled with loneliness for centuries. Mm -hmm. But it does feel like it has a different flavor today yeah. uh, because there are different factors that we're struggling with. So one of the factors is actually there are, is a structural issue, which is that we've actually become far more mobile than we ever were before, which is amazing. I came here to Louisville and it took me two hours on a flight. Wow, that's extraordinary. But it also means that we have moved away from the communities that we have known, the what we grew up with. Sometimes we move many times uh, over the life course. And that does something. You know, it, it fractures relationships and then we end up having to try to rebuild those relationships. The second thing that ha has happened has been the advent of new forms of technology that have enabled us to communicate in new ways. Now, on the face of it, this should be an outright benefit. Um, but it's been mixed. You know, sometimes we use technologies in ways that profoundly connect us. I couldn't, for example, talk to my grandmother very much when I was growing up because she was in India and we didn't have FaceTime because it didn't exist. And we didn't have email because that didn't exist either. We would write these letters on, called aerograms on these blue uh, you know, pieces of paper that some of you may remember that would take two weeks to be delivered to India. And uh, you'd buy them from the post office and it was very exciting. But um, it was certainly not very immediate. <laughs> and so technology, though, it has a potential to be great. But what has also happened, what matters is not, it's not really a question of is tech good or bad. It's a question of how do we use technology? Are we using it to optimize connection or not? And if you look at the data around this and you look at the reality of how we're using technology, you see that we're often using it in ways that diminish our connection. Uh, we are often distracted, in fact, in talking to people over dinner or just face-to-face -face by the phones that are vibrating in our pocket or often vibrating face-up on a table. Uh, we sometimes substitute our in-person, you know, face-to-face interactions for instead online interactions, uh, thinking that, well, if I've got a bunch of friends online and I'm posting on their Facebook wall or, you know, DMing them on Twitter, then that's, you know, I'm still connecting with them. Um, but it's a very different sort of level and quality of connection than engaging with people face to face. So technology is important. But I think the last one that I'll mention, I think, is the most vexing and challenging of all, which is, is culture and how our culture has evolved and shifted over time. And I worry that we have become a culture that has increasingly focused on individualism and that has also increasingly focused on work. And we have not actively said relationships and people are not important. But we've allowed those the factors, relationships and people, to slide out of neg negligence, in a sense. Um, if I told people, for example, when I, you know, 10 years ago, uh, the people I worked with, colleagues I studied with, that I was moving to a small town in Kansas because we had an amazing job opportunity. And I didn't know anyone there. We didn't have any connections. We had lots of family where I lived, and we were going to leave them behind. But I had this amazing job opportunity. People would be like, that's amazing, today. great job. That's just like, go for it. Good, you know, good for you. But if I told them, we're moving to a small town in Kansas and actually leaving amazing job prospects behind because we actually have some family in Kansas that we just want to be closer to, people would say, oh, you know, I guess that's all right, but I guess Vivek lost his ambition. Mm -hmm. you know, I guess he's not as uh, driven as he used to be. Those are the code words we use, ambition, driven, et cetera. 
But what that tells us really is that we've built a society that's centered around work and accomplishment and reputation, as opposed to a society centered around people. And what we've done is fit people in where it's convenient. Um, but that has taken its, a toll over time as we've become busier and busier and busier. All of these forces together, I think, have combined to, make, to create one of the great ironies of the modern age, which is that we are more connected than ever by technology, but more lonely and disconnected uh, than any of us thought we would be. Hmm. And what are the broader societal implications here? Um, you, you touched on it a little bit, but um, I think we know uh, uh, generally about the individual implications of loneliness, but what about collectively? Yeah, so I, I think this has um, real profound consequences for society when we're disconnected from each other, and partly because I think we evolved to be, over thousands of years, to be creatures that were truly connected yeah. uh, with one another. Uh, for example, like 5,000 years ago, if you were disconnected from everyone, if you were just going it alone, uh, then what happened to those people is they usually died. Right. A predator ate them. They starved to death because they had an inconsistent food supply. We depended on th other people for protection, for safety, uh, for food and nourishment, both you know, physical food but also just emotional nourishment as well. And over thousands of years, uh, that became baked into our nervous systems such that we felt comfortable and at home and in our sort of base state when we were connected. And when we are in fact disconnected, especially for prolonged periods of time, that actually placed us in a physiologic stress state. Now, imagine this, like several thousand years ago, if I was immediately disconnected from, from my tribe, so to speak, then I, being in a state of stress and hypervigilance was actually a good thing, right? Because if there was a twig that snapped behind me, even if there was just a 1% chance that that was a predator stepping on a branch, I wanted to interpret it as a predator because my life depended on it. But now imagine in 2019, when I'm struggling with loneliness and I'm in a state, a high stress state, in a state of hypervigilance as a result of that, and I start to interpret benign signals around me as threats. Uh, you come and ask me if I want to have lunch, and instead of saying, gosh, you know, I was feeling lonely, I'm going to say yes, because I, I, I would love the connection. Instead, I say, well, you know, this guy just thinks that you know, I'm somebody to be pitied. He's probably trying to trap me. He's probably to, you know, making fun of me or looking down at me in some way. Screw him. I'm not going to go, out, you know, go to lunch with him. And that seems like a bizarre reaction because you know, I should be doing exactly the opposite. But this is a, this strange cycle uh, that we get into sometimes with hypervigilance. Um, so I think the societal implications are quite broad because when you begun, enter that cycle of loneliness, you can go deeper and deeper and deeper. And if as a society we are pursuing a path of that's largely individual, doing our own thing and fitting in people when it's convenient, then more and more people start falling by the wayside, struggling with loneliness and becoming lonelier and lonelier as a result. And that impacts our workplaces. It means that we're, right now, if you look at the data on loneliness, uh, even, and there's a wide range in, uh, of prevalence data, meaning that there are some studies that show you know, that loneliness is far more common than others. But even if you take the conservative numbers, it still places loneliness at around 20% among adults in the United States. Right? That's, that's a huge, huge number. And that's likely underreported because these are people who are self-reporting loneliness. Um, if you imagine that, then it's almost guaranteed that in all of our workplaces that there are people who are struggling with loneliness. So this impacts the productivity, like in our workplaces. I visited one of the, uh, you know, one of the schools yesterday here, in public schools in Engelberg in, uh, you know, in, in Louisville that has a compassionate schools project, uh, you know, sort of instituted at that, uh, at that school. And I realized that uh, talking to the teachers and having spoken to the teachers at many other schools, that many kids are struggling with loneliness too, and it impacts their academic performance. It impacts the behavioral issues that they struggle with. And what do we do when kids uh, encounter or do, you know, present with behavioral issues? Well, we try to medicate them. We try to label them as problem children, uh, and we suspend them or push them out of school, which is like the, often the last thing that they need. And so we enter this destructive cycle in terms of how we're dealing with our children. But whether it's the workplace or whether it's in schools, whether it's in society more broadly where people are feeling increasingly separated and distanced from other people, that disconnection affects our ability to function together as a society. Every healthy society depends on its ability to come together during difficult times uh, and address big challenges ahead. Mm -hmm. Because there are tough decisions that we have to make. We can't make everything on short-term cycles. We have to look ahead and make hard decisions now and pay a price now knowing that we and our children will be better off in 10 years. But we can't make those decisions together uh, if we can't sit together, be connected with each other, and truly listen 
to each other. And so this is why loneliness is important, not just for our individual health, but has really broad implications for how we function as a society. In your travels, in your studies, in your research, in your experience, uh, what are solutions that you're experiencing? Um, yeah, you know, so part of the reason I decided to write a book on this subject, and, and I'd love to tell you I had this great, brilliant idea of writing this book from the beginning. Actually, no, I was going to write a different book, and the universe was just hammering me over the head like again and again through different people telling me I should write this book, and I kept ignoring it, and finally I realized that this is a book I need to write, not just to share with the world what is happening with loneliness and strategies for how we can address it, but frankly, on a, on a selfish level, I realized that I needed this book too. I needed to do the work of learning how to build a more connected life for myself, for my family, in my own community. And so in the process of doing this, I've actually come across many inspiring solutions. So to me, the, the issue of loneliness is not a depressing issue. It's actually a very optimistic issue and a heartening issue because I see people all over the country who are starting to recognize the challenge of loneliness but who are pulling together to try to build stronger neighborhoods and stronger communities. Some, example, some quick examples of that. The guy, there's a healthcare system that I visited, uh, the Caremore Health System in, in Southern California, which has recognized that many of their patients are struggling with loneliness, and it impacts their health directly, but also impacts whether they're able and willing to come to the hospital for follow-up appointments. So they set up a togetherness program to allow their employees to connect uh, with patients and then to, to help them strengthen social connection in their own life more broadly. There's a program I ran into in a, a school in South Florida called the uh, We Dine Together program, which was started by students who recognized that lunchtime is one of the loneliest times in the school day. Because it's when so many children you know, worry that they're not gonna have anyone to eat with and that fear is realized hmm. when they're sitting alone at a table. Uh, and these kids realized that and decided that they were gonna ensure that no child ever had to eat alone if they didn't want to. And so they created a group uh, and they would actually actively go out and find children who were eating alone and bring them together. And the friendships that have been fostered uh, through that group have been absolutely incredible. And you know, so just like that, there are now companies that I'm coming across that are realizing that connection is important uh, for their workplaces and are embarking on both two things. One is research to understand more broadly who's impacted by loneliness and are bringing employees together to fashion uh, programs to actually address loneliness there. As promising as these are at a societal level, and they are important because our environment matters a lot in terms of whether we are connected or not. The, the, the other thing to remember is that there are choices that we make also about whether or not we are connected to others. And this comes back to one of the ideas we were talking about earlier, which is a choice about whether we live in a work-centered society or a people-centered society. And I think that what I would love to do in my own life, what I would love for all of us to be able to do more and more, is to move toward a people-centered life. And that means recognizing, number one, that we have to be present with the people that we interact. And this device that's in my pocket and in many of our pockets can often distract us uh, from other people. I mean, there's interesting and good data showing that even if you take your phone and put it on silent, but if you leave it on the table uh, during a conversation, you might think, oh, can I just focus on the person in front of me? But the data clearly shows that both people feel worse about the quality of the conversation than if the phone is not there at all, right? So presence matters. And even if we were to take, fifth, say, we're gonna spend five minutes a day focused on the people that we love in our life. That could mean that we look at them face to face and have a real conversation. It could mean that we call uh, our mother or our daughter or our son and have a real conversation with them. It could mean that we FaceTime with a dear friend you know, and have five uninterrupted minutes where we focus on, on, on having a real connection. Um, those small incremental investments make a really big difference. Um, the last piece I should mention around this is that as much as presence is important, as much as I believe we have to reinvest in cultivating empathy uh, in all generations at a time where social media, I think, has actually drained much of our empathy and compassion for others, I also think that one of the most important elements and parts of connecting with other people is being able to connect with ourselves. What I mean by this is that if we do not believe that we matter, if we don't think that we are valued, if we don't think that we belong, it actually makes, us harder, makes it harder for us to connect to other people. After all, why would I think that others would want to connect with me if I didn't think I was worthy of connecting with at all? 
And I worry about this particularly for the younger generation that's in school and in college right now, because unlike older generations before them, they are bombarded through so many different channels with messages that tell them that they are not thin enough, not good looking enough, that they don't have enough friends, that they're not likable enough, that they don't have enough personality, they're not extroverted enough. And what does that do to you as a child when you're constantly being told that you don't have enough? Well, you start to do what uh, some of my friends' children uh, do on Instagram, which is that they never post photos of themselves unfiltered on Instagram. But they always they use apps to adjust their nose a little bit, to shape their chin a bit, to you know, bring their hairline forward a little bit, to do whatever they want to do to make themselves more attractive, and they post that. And that's just normal. Uh, and so building that connection with ourself is extremely, extremely important. Look, I know that we're, we're actually getting close to our time here. Mm -hmm. And so this is the last thought I, I wanted to share, which is that you know, as I think about this larger issue of loneliness and, and social connection, to me, this is an issue that really strikes at the heart of what we need to be thinking about uh, in the future in terms of what kind of society that we want to build. And one of the core questions I think that it raises for us is, are, are we willing to be a society where we take care of each other. Because as important as technological solutions are, uh, there are old medicines that I believe we have forgotten at times. And one of those is the power of looking out for each other, of caring for each other, of being there for each other. And I, I'm often reminded of a, a you know, when I think about that, I'm often reminded of a, a father uh, who I met um, several years ago who tragically lost his son uh, in the horrific Newtown shooting, uh, where a shooter took the lives of so many innocent children in an elementary school and, and their teachers. And this man's name uh, was Mr. Barden. His son was Daniel Barden. And Daniel was six years old when he was killed. But his father said to me that even though he was only six, that he would go to school every day. <coughs> And at lunchtime or during recess, he would always look out to see which kids were eating alone or playing alone. And he would go up to them. And he would talk to them. Or sometimes he wouldn't talk to them. Sometimes he would just literally sit next to them. And nobody taught Daniel how to do that. That was instinctual. He was born with that kind of empathy. And I think most of us are born with that kind of empathy. The path to building a more connected society is not a path to transform people into something they're not. It is a quest to return ourselves to who we ultimately were and always have been, which is beings who are empathic, who are compassionate, who in their best moments do, in fact, look out for each other. I was reminded of how important it is to look out for each other. And just two months ago, on a very personal level, when my wife and I um, woke up uh, one morning on a Saturday, and we, as we always do, you know, we're playing with our children in the morning, our two and a half year old and our 14 month old. And we noticed that our 14 month old daughter was not putting her right leg down. She was not weight bearing on the right. And we grew very concerned. You know, her older brother and her had been horsing around a lot and we didn't know if she had injured her knee. And then we started to have scarier thoughts, which is one of the dangers about being in the medical profession is sometimes you think about the worst. <laughs> But we started wondering, well, does she have an infection in the joint? Is something more sinister going on? And so we rushed her to the emergency room, and we waited there, um, trying to figure out, you know, as the doctors had tests, what was actually happening. And I will tell you that it doesn't matter if you're a doctor, it doesn't matter if you're the Surgeon General, there is no, there is no other role that you occupy in a situation like that other than being a scared parent. Mm -hmm. Because there's no amount of medical training that makes a difference in, in those moments. And that's what was happening to Alice and me. We were deathly scared something was wrong. Now the doctors came and poked and prodded. They pressed on her leg, could clearly see that there was point tenderness, something was happening in the leg, but the ultrasound, the x-ray weren't telling them what it was. Now they needed to get an MRI ultimately, which meant that they, given that she was so young, they had to put her uh, to sleep completely for the MRI so she wouldn't move. And they didn't have somebody on staff to do that because it was a weekend, it was actually a long weekend, and so they were scrambling to figure out how can they pull the right people together so anesthesia could be there and the machine could be, operator could be there and everyone could coordinate to get this all done. But we were faced with the prospect that she may need to wait a day or even two to get this scan. And our worry was that if there was an infection sitting there, a day or two could be catastrophic for her. 
And so we waited and we hoped and we prayed that she would be able to get this scan soon. And the hospital moved, moved mountains and they brought the right people in eventually and they were able to get this scan. And when they got this scan, we saw her finally being wheeled out of the room, the MRI suite. We were desperate just to go there to hold her, to touch her, make sure she was okay. But before we could do that, the doors opened and a team of surgeons swooped in. And they said, we've looked at the scans already. And we see that she has an abscess, a collection of bacteria, that's at the far end of her thigh bone, her femur. And it's right up against the growth plate. And they said, we need to get in urgently. We need to take her to the operating room and drain that and clean it out right now. And I mean, we, it, was, it was probably one of the scariest moments you know, of our life. Uh, but they took her in. Thankfully, they were able to wash it out completely. They were able to identify which bacteria was actually growing, get her on the right antibiotics. And I remember the, the next day, one of the doctors came by, and we realized that he had been instrumental in helping to like, pull all the pieces together so she could get the scan. Because when we went down to the radiologist to talk to them to look at the scan, the radiologist said, wow, this is right there against the growth plate. If you had waited 24 hours more, it could have invaded the growth plate. And for all we know, that could have affected her growth in her leg. And so we, when this doctor came by, we were just thanking him profusely. We said, thank you so much for being there and for helping us get our, our little girl cared for in the way that she needed. And after my thank, I just, I was completely inarticulate. I was just, couldn't say anything but thank you, thank you, thank you. And I was like, had tears, I was like blubbering, I was just a mess. And he finally just stopped me and put his hand on my shoulder and he said, Vivek, he said, there's no need to thank me. He said, Vivek, you're one of us. And when he said that, you know, it, it made me feel like I belonged. It made me feel like there were people who cared for us and who were looking out for us. And it didn't escape me that there are so many times in all of our lives where we walk through the dark, dark hallways of life feeling that we're alone, that there isn't someone to take care of us. The extraordinary thing about this is that he, what he did in that moment is he, he allowed himself to express his love for us through the service that he provided. And what we have realized, like in our own lives, ever since we found out that we were pregnant with our first son, is we've realized that, there's, that the most fundamental question, the most fundamental issue like of our time that's going to determine whether or not our children have a safe environment to grow up in, is the question of what happens in this deep struggle that's happening in our country, in our world, between love and fear. Because that is the truth, is that we are locked in this deep struggle between love and fear. And this love is, fear manifests in lots of different ways. It's showing up as insecurity, as anger, as jealousy, uh, as rage. But the love shows up as well, as kindness, as compassion, as empathy, as generosity. And we realize that as much as our instincts and who we are is to be beings of love, that many people in our country are living in a place of fear. And many of us, if not all of us, are having many moments where we are living in that fear as well. It's affecting our lives, it's affecting our communities, and it's affecting our country and the world. And so the question that I think is the most important for us to ask ourselves is what are we going to do to tip the scales away from fear and towards love? What are the decisions we are going to make and how we live our life in terms of where we put our attention? What are the decisions we're going to make about what we decide to do with our careers, about how we decide to get involved in our communities that will help shift through the power of our example and involvement those scales away from fear and toward love? And I know this is not an easy thing to do, but I have come to believe that love is not a source of weakness, and that it's not something that makes that sappy or something that drains us of our strength. But love is, in fact, the greatest source of strength we have. It's what enables us to go above and beyond as parents, as family members, as friends, as community members, and do things that nobody would ever, quote unquote, rationally do, but which love guides us to do. And if you ever doubt the power of love, 
you ever have those moments where you're skeptical that the love that you have to offer can ever change the world? There's a very simple thing you can do that just takes 10 seconds. Take, take your hand and hold it up in the air for a moment. Now take that hand and put it over your heart and close your eyes for a moment. I want you to think about the people in your life who have showered you with unconditional love, the people who have been there for the dark moments and for the great triumphs, people who have been there during your moments of doubt and confusion, the people who have believed in you even when you weren't sure if you believed in yourself, the people who helped to remind you of just who you are, Think about the love that they have given you, about the strength that that has afforded you, about the courage that that's given you, about the peace that it's surrounded you with. Open your eyes. And what you felt in those 10 seconds, that is the power of love. That is what love can do for us. That is how love can transform lives at scale. We don't need training or special education or degrees to figure out how to love. We just need to remember who we fundamentally are. And as a doctor who spent many years training and who has written prescriptions for complex medications that are the result of amazing scientific breakthroughs, I will tell you There is nothing that I have ever prescribed that is nearly as powerful as love. Love is the oldest medicine we have. It is the most powerful source of healing that we have as well. And so my ask of you as you go forth to your lives in Louisville and across the country is to think about how you can be a force that can shift those scales away from fear and towards love to think about how you can, do, by doing so, create a more vibrant community for your children, for my children, and for all of us. Because the truth is that whatever faith system you belong to, whether it's an organized religion, or whether you choose to put your faith in the broader universe, or in an entity that has no name, the truth is that the faith that brings all of us together faith that we have to remember more urgently now than ever before is our shared humanity. That's the most powerful connection between us. That's what we have to remember if we want to address loneliness in America and around the world. It's the foundation on which we build everything else. So I want to thank you all so much for the time and the attention that you've given to these issues today. Everything that we have talked about today and yesterday, these are at the heart of not just what ails us, but what we need to focus on to create a more healthy, vibrant society. And if we give our attention to each other and look out for each other, if we choose to believe in the power of love over fear, if we choose to recognize that we are not broken, but that we are whole, and it is when we forget our wholeness that we experience pain, then we can hopefully return to who we really are, beings of love and compassion, beings who have the power to heal and to build the kind of world that all of us deserve. Thank you all so much.